Armenians are really, really proud of their, their traditional culture, which is amazing to see this kind of, this level of pride that they have for their culture and where they come from. I think the new generation is taking tradition and definitely giving it a new spin. I think that a lot of young Koreans and even young people interested in Korea are seeking out traditions, Korean traditions, and embracing them. And once they learn the basics or the fundamentals, they want to play with those traditions and kind of do something different. Pottery is great. The simplicity and the elegance of each form and kind of the purpose it serves. It kind of like holds a very subtle but powerful um, presence, wh whether it's in your home or in your kitchen. My name is Peter Kang and I'm a ceramic potter. I'm graduating in February and my semester is pretty much finished. Um, I think during the process of creating like the pieces for my final exhibition and seeing the result and seeing like all my friends and family come really support me. Um, following your dreams and your passions, it does lead somewhere and you're, you don't have to kind of have the stereotype of being like a struggling artist. We found ourselves in Hongdae. Peter would be graduating from Hongik University in a few weeks. So we joined him in the pottery studio to see what he'd been up to during the fall semester. These are some of the pieces from my just grad exhibit. Okay. I've already taken some of the pieces home, but these are all oh, that's very left. Cool. I like the yeah. colors. Yeah, thank you. It's, I tried mimicking a wood kiln as much as possible, so I tried using like natural ash glazes. So. Oh, okay. Um, this is like a glaze that's really heavy on iron, and then this one's like Bone ash. What, so, what are these? What would these pieces be used for? Like, what, what's the style? Um, it's pretty decorative these days. Um, it's kind of like my twist on like the Korean hangari, like the Korean jar. The kind of the Korean twist on these different pottery pieces. I think it's it comes out more subconsciously. Like, I would see images of like um, pottery from um, different eras and um, how a lot of those same vessels. I can witness some in my own pottery. So it's been interesting just kind of seeing um, kind of the heritage in me just coming out very naturally. So what's the basic process that we're going to follow here? Um, so we'll center and we'll open and we'll just create a cylinder just to begin with. Okay. How, how did you get into pottery in the first place? started in high school. One of my um, teachers was like, hey, Koreans uh, have like a deep uh, history with pottery and it's in their heritage. And growing up in Minnesota, I was kind of one of the few Asian people. And so I was just like, cool, I can identify with something Korean for once. And then that's kind of how um, I grasped it as my own. The idea of centering is like compressing the clay so that it conforms to your hands and you not to it. Okay. And so from the side, you'll be giving pressure from the side, like using like this area. So, but at the same time, you want to kind of be cupping your hand on top and you want to like apply pressure from the top. One of the first things I learned was like easy on, easy off. So like when you come onto the clay, you want to gently touch it and then you want to like compress the clay. And then when you come off, you, you like come off gently. Because if you like come off too suddenly, then like the clay can start to wobble. So um, how hard is it to learn technique? Um, technique is all just in practice. So I mean, it just takes a bit of time and patience. For me, because I do mainly wheel throwing, um, even though it's like a perfect tool, like it's perfectly circular. I love being able to kind of push the limits of that tool and create these forms that are very organic. When you compare back home in Korea, would you say like people like that, people like a certain style here, like they want to have this perfect cylinder or they like the organic form or? Korean people do value kind of more natural, very functional, 
very earth tone, so I think there's a high value for that. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? My thing just fell, so I built it up and then I, and then I, the edge was getting all wobbly and so I put it back and then it just... Look at this. <laughs> I started to make like a pouring, a gravy, a gravy serving dish because that's all that I could get out of this. This is to play <laughs> practical jokes on your grandmother at Christmas time. Is I'm, what I'm, I'm literally, I'm going to have no clay left. <laughs> yeah. As you're talking and you are looking over at your um, like hanoris that you made, and I'm just like, holy shit, you know? <laughs> Until you start actually sitting here and playing a little bit, and then you're like, well, I can have a little bit more appreciation for it, you know, like as to what goes into it. I enjoy creating a, an atmosphere of like comfort and peace, very hospitable. We, we just had like a housewarming party the other day. And so just to kind of create this, like this wholeness around the dinner table for people to come uh, interact with each other, but also interact with my art. So incorporating that into the home is something I really value. We can um, set down our pieces here. Okay, cool. Yeah. Let them dry. Yeah, just let them dry here. So what's this? Um, These are the kilns? Yeah, this oh, is wow, our... this is pretty intense. Yeah, for sure. And I think they're being fired right now. Shimopo. So like when we load them, like we just load these kiln shelves and they go all the way up. Oh, okay. And yeah. So how many would fit in here, do you think? Um, you can fit like hundreds of pieces in here. Oh, wow. Yeah, this is our glass blowing facility. This is our furnace, like where we keep all the glass. Um, you can take a look. It's just molten glass. Wow. This is just where all our electric kilns are, so uh, okay. it's pretty similar to the first room we saw. So this is, this is your last year, yeah. right? Sure. Yeah, how does it feel? Uh, it feels really good, like, yeah. um, been in school for a while, um, and it's been challenging. It's been good but challenging being, studying in a foreign country, like, with different cultures, different languages, but I mean, the experience has been well worth it, and even the school, being able to learn under such like gifted and talented um, professors who are actually in the field and they're serving as artists. And, um, That's really cool. Yeah, it's been a great experience. Yeah, I'm just really hoping for just more open doors, more open, open opportunities for me to be able to work and to um, yeah, pursue a career in art. We left Peter to meet up with Chris, a graphic designer who had organized a topography exhibition in Gunja. Titled Post Text, The Destiny of Shit, the show featured 28 international designers and played with modern explorations of a familiar script, Hangul. There's kind of a crew of friends that I have here and they're all graphic designers and they're all just like me. They're Korean American or they're kind of almost semi sort of Korean and they're all doing graphic design, and, and, a, and a lot of our conversations center around this grayness. We're kind of gray people. We're not, we're not Koreans, we're not Americans, we're just kind of in the middle. So we thought it'd be nice to kind of have an exhibition to kind of tell some of these stories. The, the concept behind the show is about poop, right? So we thought, okay, first let's have a, a show kind of exposing these kind of stories in relations to Korea, and we thought, Let's pick a subject that relates to all kinds of cultures. And if you, you know, as you probably know, poop everywhere has a really, really kind of different kind of environment uh, or atmosphere. Koreans and Germans, I think, are very, very similar. It's part of their daily vocabulary. They'll, yeah. they'll reference poop in all kinds of different ways. Americans, I mean, we're a little bit more sensitive about it, I right. think. Uh, on TV, that's a piece of poop or, yeah. you know, yeah. like... It's a little bit more sensitive. So we thought it'd be really, really funny kind of uh, subject to kind of play with. The idea, we thought it'd be really crazy actually. We, we enjoyed kind of the shock factor of poop because I'm pretty sure, I'm not in, entirely sure, but I'm pretty sure in the whole world, we are the first graphic design exhibition about poop ever. I'm almost positive actually. The other things that we were interested in is how it ties back to Korea. So we made two rules. 
they must use a proverb about poop. And Koreans have tons and tons of really? proverbs about poop. The other thing is they must use hangul. And for this exhibition, this is the first time a lot of these designers were using hangul. They've been very well trained in Roman typography, but they've never had to use hangul before. I'm particularly fascinated by type because I think it's amazing in that it can communicate, but it can also express at the same time. So I think it's pretty fascinating that I can go anywhere and I can read letters, but I can also get an experience from reading letters. What is this in? This was an interesting one. She's actually German, Korean, but she is adopted, actually. Oh, okay. So she has never spent a large amount of time here at all, in Korea at all. Her proverb is uh, kind of a funny one. So it uh, basically equates to on your wedding day you go poop or <laughs> you must take a poop on your wedding day or something like that. And I, I don't quite know the meaning. It's a little strange. I, know, I don't quite know the exact meaning, but she, what she was trying to interpret was, and if you look here, it's like Germany and Korea, Korea and Germany. She uh -huh. is again in this kind of weird place and she expressed it in her text too, like her um, explanation for this. She doesn't feel at home either place, actually. The other funny thing is, like, a lot of these proverbs, nobody, nobody uses them now. It's really strange. Like, I think 70% of them had to do a lot of research. Like, they had to ask their parents. They had to ask their grandparents. They had to ask their uncles, relatives, what the hell does this mean? Like, what, what is this, you know, what, what are they trying to get at with this? And that was kind of fun, too. So it was, again, it was a way for them to kind of have to reach out and kind of find some kind of connections. Actually, this is uh, the poster that I was working on. What is your problem? It's Jaetong Palpko, Palpko, Juje, Jujo Annen Kyok, actually. Eventually, I kind of got the gist that it's kind of like if you wish ill of others, you're going to be kind of swimming in your own poop, actually. Right. So don't wish or don't do ill of others. So, oh. so basically, if you look at this, I kind of wanted to make this massive poop, if you will, just like uh, hitting the very, very edges of the, yeah. the maximum print capacity, actually. So this is a giant tong, which is tigut tigut o yung. So, yeah. And then Na is right in the middle. Yeah, You're that's, in the middle of the poop. I'm in the middle of the poop, actually. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, I like yeah. that. It's, again, kind of a labor of love. Like, it's, it's not about necessarily making some kind of profit, but I think it's just been fun. It's just been, I mean, it's really cool to meet 28 other designers from all around the world that are kind of Korean and kind of do a project together. I mean, that's a really, really good opportunity. To show us how his designs came to life, Chris took us to Chungmudo. So I'm going to be taking them to the printing district of Seoul. It's one of the few areas of Seoul not changed. Like, it's, it's like this kind of weird mishmash of Western culture and old Korean culture, and it's very ajishi. It's like very man kind of culture. Well, I love that you can look into all these little places and they've got, each one has like a printing machine and a different, different style going on or yeah. something like that. Koreans also are very kind of community based. It's like a network of printers. So unlike the States where printers are often outside of the city in like big kind of warehouses or, or factories, these guys are all right next to each other and they all kind of know what each other do and depending on the job, they kind of bounce from each other. Oh, we've got a big job, we need to press this big. This is really crazy. Yeah, it's really nice. So this looks like a folding machine, right? Yeah, so this is both, I think, folding and eventually binding, actually. Oh, really? For me, these guys are I think it could be, you could equate it to a lot of different things. Uh, an architect and a contractor or an engineer or a web designer and a programmer, uh, a graphic designer and a printer, it all kind of works the same way. Like the designer is the planner, the designer is the one that has kind of a vision, but how that comes to life, it's up to the hands of the printer. Here's our printer here actually. Oh, okay, yeah. so this is the printer that you use. Um, yeah. Cool. Yeah, uh, yeah, <laughs> He's actually going to run a couple proofs. I just check the color. If everything looks okay, then he's going to fire up all that I need, actually. So here in Korea, it's really fast. They'll crank it out in a night or two nights, something that in the States will take a week or two weeks, actually. It's really funny. A conversation I'll often have, I'll ask him, well, when, when are you going to get this done? He's like, oh, 
I'll get it done by tomorrow. I'm like, what the? Are you serious? And he's like, yeah. I'll just stay up all night. And I'm like, oh, you don't need to stay up all night. He's like, oh, I was going to stay up all night anyway, so don't worry about it. So it's, it's kind of like that. There's two rollers here. One is for ink and one is for water. Okay. And the way they combine, the water repels the ink. Okay. So the ink catches, and it catches on this tube here. And then the paper spits through here, and that's how it's printed. So if you this look so here, cool. it's the, the sheets are being fed into the machine right now. It helps to have a really, really good kind of relationship with these guys because they'll explain, you know, oh, the benefits of doing something like this or the benefits of doing something like that. So I think it's, it's a really, really kind of nice relationship to, to keep developing. What do you think about it? Yes, I think it's a good thing. 이걸 선택했거든요. 네. 비슷한 질감을 가지고. 아, 네, 네. 인쇄 상태는 어떠세요? 어, 제가 볼 때는 뭐다뭐 뭐 깨끗하게 나오고 뭐 괜찮은 것 같아요. 네. 아, 그래요? 이거는 근데 이거 그 먼지 때문에 지금 그렇죠. 그렇죠? 지분이 네. 종이에 날리는 먼지 때문에 아, 네. 그런 게 나타나는 거죠. 네. 오케이. 네. 저는 뭐 괜찮습니다. 아, 네. 그래요? 괜찮아요. Cool. So are you going to take this stuff home with you today or No, he said it's going to take a day to dry and then tomorrow Saturday I guess they're working tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. They're going to fold and cut it tomorrow, actually. Well, thank you so much for showing us everything. It was really cool. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for showing us everything. It was clear we had found a generation of artists that were exploring traditional Korean culture in a new way. We decided to look at a craft that most Koreans were very familiar with, makgeolli. We invited our friends Dan and Becca on a journey to Paju. It was where we found Che Hong Suk's brewery, an expert makgeolli maker. She was one of the few brewers who still use traditional methods. Makali isn't really that hard to do. Uh, probably the most important thing is making sure that you have high quality ingredients and that you keep everything sanitized. She had already washed and cooked the rice for us, and then began to mix it with nuruk, a yeast culture that was unique to Korea. The nuruk would initiate the fermentation process and would also give the makgeolli its distinctive flavor. Well, initially, we weren't interested in makgeolli at all, possibly because the first makgeolli we tried, we didn't know any better, so it wasn't very good. It wasn't really until after we started brewing that we fell in love with makgeolli. Wow, I've never done this before. This is cool. Really? Yeah. Because usually you just, how do you do it? Like, you know, mix it together, yeah. you know, stir it up. Show us how it's done. I don't have a lot of first-hand experience with a lot of the traditional methods, and they're not quite so common anymore. This isn't the exact same process that you guys use, is it? Right, mm -hmm. yeah. Adding in the starter to mm -hmm. the first fermentation is definitely a new thing. Oh, really? Yeah. I mean, it's definitely, like, it smells so much like makgeolli. This is a really nice way to make the flavor more predictable. It's a really good strategy. Right. Makgeolli was traditionally a farmer's beverage. And until recent times, it wasn't considered very cool. I think it's just one of those things, the same way that the clothes that someone's parents were wearing in the 70s, really short shorts, they've been gone long enough that people think they're strange and funky. It's old enough that it feels new. We let the containers begin their fermentation process. The makgeolli would be ready to drink in a few weeks. 
We returned to the city to see what Dan and Becca had up their sleeves. At Susubori Academy in Chungjong No, we stepped into what looked more like a science lab versus Bruce Base. <laughs> Susubori uses a lot of modern equipment, as well as uh, a lot of modern research. So what are we working on today? So today we're going to be making a recipe called Jolju. Jolju. And it's from a recipe book that's over 300 years old. Uh, the end result is really thick, almost like a yogurt pudding. Oh, wow. And it's really sweet and rich and almost tastes like port. So the trade-off is it's a bit of a hassle to make which is why you're going to help us with the most tedious part of it. Sure. Okay, cool. As of now, this is uncooked. Okay. And what we're going to do is make something called gumong dok, mm -hmm. which is um, like a boiled rice donut. Cool. And that's what we're going to ferment. And this is how you're going to know maybe if you need more water or not. So you're going to get a lump of it, and you're just going to kind of flatten it out in your hand. And... Um, you're going to try and pinch a hole into it. You actually are not supposed to add so much water that it sticks together like a dough. Oh. So when you're making the donuts, they fall apart, and it's actually quite annoying. Mm. <laughs> so so how, many, how many recipes do you, ha do you guys have that are 300 years old? That's... Uh, well, we have a lot of recipes that are like that. Um, uh, you know, several we've, hundred. Yeah, several, really? several hundred. Yeah. We're in the process of working our way through. So what do, how do they vary? Like, the base is rice, so it's all kind of similar. But right. Um, how they vary is um, the way you process the rice mm -hmm. and the kind of rice that you use, like whether you use sticky rice or the regular short grain rice. Mm -hmm. So that changes the flavor. And also the water content uh, will make the uh, flavor change as well as the nuruk, the yeast cake. Like this is totally different from what we did in Paju. Sure. Right. Yeah. Like the mashing is different from donuts. We got involved with Susubori about two years ago. We'd had some brewing and fermentation practice and experience before we came to Korea, and it was something that we wanted to get back into. Now, something like this one, is this, would this ever be available commercially? Can you buy this kind of makgeolli anywhere? Is it available? Yeah. Is it common? Not at all. As far as its commercial viability, uh, the main thing is it, it's really a pain, so and it's time consuming. <laughs> so I mean, you'd have to find some sort of industrial shortcut sure. to, or just not like three thousand. Or it would just be <laughs> pressing these things out. Most production makulis take about five to seven days to produce. Higher alcohol content brews can take up to five or six months. Do you think are people like back home in the U.S. or Europe? really open to the flavor because it's kind of a, a unique taste. Yeah, I think, you know, it's just a matter of what people are familiar with and where it's from and the opportunities they have to try out a decent variety. Yeah, we've really come to appreciate more difficult flavors. Bitter stuff, sour, more complex drinks are it's the kind of stuff we usually end up with. Okay, so this is in here. We are going to leave it for two to three days. Okay. And then we will add water at that point, as well as steamed rice. I'm coming back in a few days. You're gonna try it out? I'm gonna come back days? and check it out, yeah. Straight from the source? Yeah, yeah this is good. I think this is a really exciting time, like with how delicious traditional makgeolli can be, as well as really appreciating the craft of it. I think it's cool. Thank you.